Almost 35 years ago, it was a little hospital in southern Delaware, and I was not even ill. I had simply gone in to have a baby. It was my second child. And I can remember lying on the delivery table, experiencing labor pains, and suddenly I had a really horrendous pain. And I put the nose cone of trilene that I had been given up to my nose and inhaled very, very deeply. Now at that point I should have become unconscious and I knew that I should be unconscious, but I wasn't. I remained fully conscious, totally aware. I was in blackness, I couldn't see anything, but I was thinking to myself, this isn't the way it's supposed to be. I'm not supposed to know anything right now, and I do. What on earth has happened, I wondered. And at that point, I felt something leave my body. It was a whoosh. It went up through the top of my head. I could feel it, and I could hear it. Just a soft, gentle whoosh. And at that point, I found myself standing in a kind of gray mist. And then I knew, I knew that I had died. You see, when I found myself standing in this gray mist with the realization that I had died, I remember feeling so overjoyed and so thrilled because I knew that even though I was what we call dead, I was still very much alive, very much alive. I was totally aware. And I began to pour out these feelings of thanksgiving. I wasn't doing it verbally, but it seemed that the very essence of me was saying, thank you, thank you, thank you, God. Thank you that you set it up this way, that I really am, I really am immortal. I was not annihilated. And I was involved in this tremendous pouring forth of gratitude and joy and as that was going on inside me, this white light started infiltrating my consciousness and it came into me. It seemed that I went out into it. I expanded into it as it came into my field of consciousness. And there was nothing that I was aware of except this brilliant white light. And the light brought with it the most incredible feelings of total love, total safety, total protection. And I was just enveloped in this. I remember, I remember feeling almost cradled by it. It was, it was so dynamic, it was almost palpable. And as I existed in this white light and in this incredible love, I began to be rapturous. And the rapture built and the bliss built. And my, my, my consciousness of everything seemed to expand with the, with the bliss of it all. And suddenly there came into my field of consciousness an entire field of knowledge. It was like a block. It was like a whole block of knowledge that just simply came in and settled itself on me. And I knew what takes several sentences to tell. But it didn't come in in several sentences. It just came in all of a piece. And what I knew was that I was immortal, that I was eternal, that I was indestructible, that I always had been and that I always would be, and that there was no way in this world that I could ever be lost, that it was impossible for me to fall into a crack in the universe somewhere and never be heard from again. I just knew that I was utterly safe and that I always had been forever and ever and ever. And I felt myself going. Uh, I was in a great deal of pain. Uh, it was a very frightening experience. Uh, but I began to, to slip. I just sort of 
feel myself going. And I remember trying to hold on. I'll be okay, I'll be okay. And it got to the point where you know, I just couldn't. And everything began to just become very quiet. And I can remember with every ounce of strength I had, I wanted to say goodbye to my wife. Uh, it was important to me. And I did. I, I remember just turning my head, looking at her and saying, uh, I'm going to die. Uh, goodbye, Joan. And I did. <clears throat> uh, it, it was then that I experienced experience what we call a, a near-death experience. Uh, for me, there was nothing near about it. <laughs> it was there. Uh, it was a total immersion in light, brightness, warmth, peace, uh, security. Uh, it, I did not <clears throat> have an out-of-body experience. I did not see my body uh, or anyone about me. I just immediately went into this beautiful bright light uh, it's difficult to describe matter of fact it's impossible to this to describe uh, verbally it cannot be expressed it, it's something which becomes you and you become it uh, I could say that I was peace I was love uh, I was the brightness uh, it was part of me I had no recollection of anything, <clears throat> excuse me, anything biological. It's not like you could see something, because your sight is biological. It's necessary here. A hearing is necessary here. A speech is necessary here. It's not there. Uh, you just know. You're, you're all knowing. Uh, everything is a part of you, and it's just so, just so beautiful. Uh, I, it was. It was eternity. Uh, it's like I was always there, and I will always be there. That my existence on Earth was just a very brief instant. And she's screaming, and she's running down the stairs toward me. And anytime your mother-in-law is screaming and running toward you, you have to worry a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and but I had no idea what was going on. And as I noticed that as she got down close to me, she was looking at me like I wasn't there. At that moment, the only thought that came to me was, oh, shit, I'm dead. And that was the first realization that I had that something bad had happened. So I'm, I'm standing there looking at this body that's 10 feet away, and my mother-in-law's running over toward it and she's screaming and at that point I'm calling out to them and I can hear what they're saying I can see them but they can't hear or see me and suddenly I have this realization that oh my god I'm thinking and I'm thinking and having thoughts just like I normally would and and the realization came that whoever I am I always am and whatever's on the floor is nothing more than a shell. As I'm walking up the stairs, I notice that my legs are starting to dissolve. And at that point, I was like, okay, maybe this isn't funny anymore. And by the time I got to the top of the stairs, I had lost all form. And I remember looking down at myself, thinking, you know, where did I go? Um, but it was just this hazy energy ball. I was having a full out-of-body experience. Um, I was completely separated and I was going someplace else. And when I got out of the building, that's when things really started to get interesting. I, was, I felt like I was, when I got out, I was suddenly immersed in this bluish white light. And in that white light was truly the most amazing feeling if you could imagine absolute love and peace and it was it was a force that there was absolutely nothing else in it and 
and I felt like I was in a crystal clear stream and I could see the rays of light passing through it and it had a sparkly appearance. But I, as I was thinking about this and looking at it, I could actually see the lines of the energy, which to me was amazing and because I, you know, because of my science background, I thought this is something I could measure. It's that strong. And what I was able to see was that this energy made up everything that exists and flowed through it. And I thought that whatever God is, this is it. And I was absolutely taken by how great it felt. And I thought this is the best thing that could ever happen to somebody. And as I was going someplace and I could, could feel the sensation of moving, I was going someplace. It had both speed and direction. And right about the time that I, I thought this is the greatest thing that could ever happen, then suddenly it's like somebody snapped their fingers. I was back in the body and um, my little trip was over and it was not well received. And um, I recognized that there was nothing that I could do. And then I began to fall asleep. And I, would, I had a helmet on, okay, I had a helmet on. But when I would fall asleep, I, I couldn't stop myself from falling asleep. I'd fall asleep and I'd fall off this little ledge. But I was, I was harnessed in, fall off the ledge, smack into the mountain, wake up because I smacked into the mountain, pull myself back up, pull on the rope, and at this point, I, I wasn't paying attention to Tim at all. I really, I still don't know what condition he was in and what was going on with him because my whole world was now focused interiorly um, trying to get the rope free. I don't know how many times that happened, but I, I know that at one point I pulled myself back up and as I stood there trying to pull on the rope, I watched my peripheral vision come in on me and, and outside this little line here was darkness and it was like a circle, it was like the, uh, the end of an old movie where the, it fades to black and I watched this fade to black come in and I remember thinking, what is, what's going on? What, what, what am I seeing or not seeing? And I watched it and I felt myself fall and I thought to myself, I must be falling asleep again, but then I was awake still I still had consciousness and I didn't feel myself hit the mountain. And I thought, what is this strange thing? And then in front of my vision, it opened up into a vastness in which there was a, I, from, from this point on, and I'm sure that the near-death people will um, agree with me, that there are no words to describe what I'm about to say. And so I spent my entire life uh, trying to find a way to think about what had happened and form language to give it some sort of structure to process it. Language, words are symbols of concepts. And when you get to the near-death experience place, there are no concepts because there are no things. And there is no time and there is no space. And so I saw what I describe as like an energy field, a cloud, a being that had intention and, it, and it, it filled my entire vision and it rushed toward me and it communicated to me, I'm taking you. And I took all of my willpower that I had used to survive that night. I had dug this really deep channel of, of self-will and, and survival, a, a kind of a mammalian, I'm going to not die, drive. Um, and I put it up as a barrier to this intention to take me, but it took me like um, like a, a, f a football team running through a piece of paper, just plucked me right out, and I had no choice, no matter what I resisted with. And the next thing I knew, I was in this vastness, this um, described in some literature as the outer darkness, but it was completely illuminated, but there was no light, and I had no body, but I had being, and there was no time, and no space, and no thing. I had no brain, I had no language, no culture, no heartbeat, but I could think better than I'd ever thought before, as if my brain was no longer in the way of my thinking. 
And I was in this vast emptiness that extended into infinity in every direction, and I could see in every direction all at once. And like I said, it was darkness, but it was illuminated because I could see in every direction. And, and in front of me was, if I had a front, was a shimmering door. And it was transparent and translucent. And inside this doorway was a tunnel. And it was immense. It was 100 yards wide and 70 yards tall, just immense. But remember, everything I say happens in timelessness, so there's no order of events for me, and there's no language to communicate it. But I touched this thing with my being, and I felt it was living. It was like the living God was in it. And as I did that, I heard my name called from deep inside of me. And I, and I knew instantaneously that I was in the presence of God but not God like I'd ever conceived of before. And, and it was a voice, but it had no gender, and it had no sound, and it had no language, but it communicated to me directly in the depth of my being. And when my name was called, I knew that God was absolutely present to me, next to me, but I could see everything, but not God. And the voice called my name, and it was the name of my creation. It was the name given to me to make me exist. It wasn't just Peter, it was the, the ground of my being, as Paul Tillich said. The ground and the essence of my being. And I was infilled with beauty and love and hope and truth and life and joy, but it was all one thing. But also simultaneously to that infilling and knowing that I was in the presence of God, all of my experiences rushed up too. And all of the pain that I'd caused everyone in my entire life came with it. So this was in Michigan. We went to a lake uh, outside of Detroit for our class picnic. Now, while we were there, there at the lake, it was a beautiful summer day. Sun was out, the water was perfect, and there was a, uh, a floating platform about, uh, about 50 to 100 yards out. And a lot of my friends went out there early and they were waving to me to come and meet with them and, and have fun on the platform. So it was very cold water. I jumped in and started swimming to the lake. About halfway there, I started feeling cramps. And I had cramps in the lower part of my uh, abdominal area, and my legs were cramping up. And all of a sudden, I couldn't kick anymore. And I started to sink. So now I'm sinking, and I'm flapping around, and all of a sudden water is coming in my mouth, down my nose, starting to fill my lungs. I'm trying to scream out, but I can't make any sound because I'm bobbing up and down in the water. And then finally I get one chance to look up, and I scan, and I can see the, I can see the floating dock, and they're waving at me. They think we're playing a drowning game. Well, it's not a game for me. I'm really drowning. And that's the last time I saw anything. Then I started to fall deeper and deeper into the lake, and all of a sudden I felt some slimy things at my feet and those were the weeds at the bottom of the lake. By this time it was so dark I couldn't see and I sank into the bottom of the lake filled with muck and mud and I was in a sitting position when I hit bottom. So I used my hands to try to push myself up and they got stuck. Now I'm there stuck in the bottom of the lake freezing cold water because it's Michigan and it's June, just the beginning of the season, and I'm shaking from the frigid water so bad that I can't control anything, and all of a sudden I hear a voice in my head and the voice says, Andy, stop for just a minute, you need to rest. And I said back to the voice, I'm almost talking to myself now, no, I can't rest, I need one more breath of air, just one breath of air, that's all I really want. And the voice says, if you just stop for a minute, I'll, you can then continue on with the struggle. And, and so I said, okay, all right, I'll stop. And the minute I said, okay, I'll stop, I popped out of my body and I went into a tunnel. As I entered the tunnel, I turned around to look back and I could see my body stuck in the mud at the bottom of the lake. And I wondered, how could that be? Because I'm not there. I'm here in this tunnel. 
and I looked upward towards the tunnel and I saw this bright light and it was so light it was like a thousand suns all exploding at the same time and I remember saying that should be burning my retinas out but it was so bright I didn't even blink I could just look at it and it drew me in like a gentle magnet pulling me down the tunnel and as I got about halfway down the tunnel from where the light was I immediately popped into a big giant sphere it was about the size of our high school gymnasium and I'm hovering in the sphere in the center of the sphere with a light next to me and all around in every direction top bottom right left were motion pictures of me of my life and my lives and all the things that went on through through years and years of living and every time I would focus on one I would actually feel myself drawn into it and I was reliving it then but it was different than living it the first time because not only did I know what I was doing but I could feel the feelings of everyone I was interacting with and this went on for what seemed like hours and then all of a sudden I popped out back into the tunnel again and now I'm being absorbed by the light and the light says three things to me the light says Andy don't be afraid Andy I love you Andy we love you and when the light said Andy we love you to me surrounding the light are countless billions of other lights and I knew them all and I said to myself it's so good to be home because I knew that I was home that's where I belong there was absolutely no fear or apprehension from the moment I popped out of my body going down the tunnel into the sphere and then into the light again there was a a feeling of overwhelming unconditional love I felt so loved by everything and everyone that I've struggled for over 50 years now trying to find the right words in the English language mm -hmm. to explain the level and depth of love that I was consumed with because it really it really is an overwhelming feeling the, the, and, and, it, and it's a feeling of being loved to the extent that there is no comparison it's not like oh it was really a great feeling of love or a lesser feeling of love there are there are no adjectives to describe the unconditional love that I felt because it was all-encompassing my vibrations my my body vibrations my soul vibrations my the Andy vibrations blended in with the with the unconditional love in the light and, and we became one so mm -hmm. it was it was so obvious to me that I had gone back home where I came from and I came from unconditional love. I was bicycling in a, in a small town just outside of Boulder, Colorado, and was hit broadside. Um, so I was bicycling, you know, like this, and was hit broadside by a woman driving a very large SUV. And she was texting while she was driving and didn't pay attention. Anyway, long story short, I was really severely injured during that crash and had 24 bones that were broken, most in my spine and neck. And when I was brought to um, the emergency room in the trauma center, it was determined I needed surgery to fix my spine, which not a surprise. It was pretty well busted up and shattered in, in one place. So uh, two days later, I was brought into surgery. And what they were going to do is put titanium rods along my back to stabilize it so it would heal. And during that surgery, when they gave me anesthesia, um, we're not really sure exactly why this happened, because I was fairly healthy going into it. But my, uh, I, I basically coded on the operating table. I, my heart rate went to zero, flatlined. My blood pressure went to zero. Everything stopped for at least two minutes up to three minutes. And I didn't know that at the time, because when I... When they gave me the anesthesia, I just drifted off, and all of a sudden, I was in this beautiful realm. I, I you know, to, to newbies to this, I call it heaven, but that's not a good term for me. But this, I was in the spiritual realm. I was up on this beautiful hilltop, 
overlooking many, many, many layers of mountains with beautiful trees all around me. And everything glowed, like with a silvery, energetic undertone. Even the sky was pearly blue, which is really difficult to describe to have a metallic blue sky, but that's kind of what it felt like. But immediately what struck me wasn't, wasn't the landscape. It was the feeling of love coming through from this place that I was in or the state that I was in coming through me and this acceptance and welcoming. And I, I, it's very profound for me because before all this happened, I was wavering back and forth for 20 years between being an agnostic and an atheist. I didn't believe really in any of this stuff. I didn't believe in a spiritual realm. I didn't believe in any kind of a higher consciousness or a deity or anything like that. I just believed material, you know, this is all that existed. And then when we die, that was it. So when I woke up in this beautiful place with this love and acceptance, just immediately around me and I thought oh my gosh I looked around like this and I thought I think I died <laughs> <laughs> and I wonder if this is what heaven is like and as soon as I thought that I then I wondered it just it was just an internal wondering I thought to myself but I don't believe in any of this why am I here and I immediately got a, it wasn't really a, a voice I heard with my ears. It was a voice I heard inside of me that said, you are my child, welcome home. You are loved beyond all measure. And I just, I lost it. I started crying because it was so welcoming. No matter, I mean, I said, I don't believe in you. <laughs> How come I'm here? And again, the message was, you belong here. This is your home. And so I remember being in the hallway that morning on the gurney waiting to go into surgery and really being cold, just racking with cold. And I've since uh, understood that experience on a different level. But at the time, I had had a pre-op shot, but I wasn't in surgery yet. And I remember going into the surgery suite and one of the nurses was kind enough to give me this wonderful warm blanket and that seemed to calm my body down and I just went out before I went under I was already gone and I remember waking up in recovery and there was a lot of commotion going on uh, in the bed next to me in recovery and I was sort of curious as to what was going on with the person next to me, but I kind of didn't want to know, but did want to know at the same time. And as I'm looking over at them and I'm seeing the doctors and the nurses working on this person, I'm thinking, wow, there's, there's a lot going on here. And I'm kind of wondering what it is, but it's a curiosity that had no energy to it. It was just something that someone was experiencing and it was outside of my realm, but because they were so close, I was paying attention and I was watching them moving back and forth and around this person who was to my left. And I heard one of them speaking to the patient and saying their name. And I realized they were talking about me. And I thought, well, this is so strange. How can this possibly be them talking about me when I'm right here, you know? And so now I'm really kind of curious and I'm saying to who's ever standing closest to me, excuse me, uh, I heard my name, but I'm right here and I'm, I'm fine. Uh, I don't understand. And they're not paying any attention to me and I'm thinking, well, they're probably involved with what they're doing and so they're not hearing what I'm saying. And the next thing I realized is that 
I have moved now to the foot of this person's bed and I'm looking dead on at them while everybody's sort of working on this patient and I realize as I'm looking at this patient that it's me and I don't have any fear about it I'm just sort of not understanding how could that possibly be me when I'm here but I'm seeing myself there and I'm watching and I'm paying attention and the next thing I realize is I'm now floating up into the corner of the of the of the room and I'm now looking down on me in this bed with people working on me and I'm thinking how curious is this how can I possibly be viewing myself from this angle? I don't understand what's happening. But yet I didn't have any fear. I didn't have any anxiety. I was just sort of mesmerized by it, but not overwhelmed by it. And I'm, in retrospect, I'm wondering how the brain, the mind, handles seeing all of this and not being terrorized by it at the same time. And I wasn't, I had no ill feelings. And as I was contemplating that and watching what was going on to this person who's directly in front of me, I'm feeling this energy pulling me out and away from this room. And as I'm moving out, I'm seeing this blackness that I'm now moving towards. And it's surrounding everything I can visually see is just blackness and as a child I had a lot of fear of being in the dark and not being able to see any street lights or any light in the room at all and so this was really big for me to see this blackness in front of me and there were no other cues around that I could I could find and I kept feeling this push into this blackness and I, I just remember arching felt like arching my body to kind of try to pull back from it but it just kept moving me forward and as I moved forward I could feel a lightning inside of myself and I just kept looking and searching in this blackness for something to hang on to some glint of something that that felt comfortable and all right and as I'm sort of straining to see what there is for me to see. I see this little tiny glimmer, glimmer of light in the distance and as I'm looking at that glimmer and focusing more and more on it, it starts to grow. And as it starts to grow, I can't take my attention off of it because it's what I'm drawn to now. I'm drawn to this little tiny, tiny glimmer that's out there that's growing. And as it grows and starts to encompass more of the space where the darkness was, I'm feeling this pull, pulling me forward into it. I'm no longer feeling this from behind. I'm feeling this pull from in front of me into this, this glimmer of light. And all of a sudden it starts to grow and everything is illuminated in this light, including me. And I'm I'm overwhelmed by the feeling of being in this this light. It's everything I can see is the light and the feeling of it. And in that moment as I'm looking, the light starts to separate. And I'm going forward through the light and it's as if I'm floating with this separation of light. It's like walls of illuminated light, a, a, a brilliance I had never seen in my life, and, and a feeling of such joy and overwhelming ecstasy being in this illumination of light. And as I'm moving forward, in front of me there appears two rows, one on either side of me, of these hooded beings and having been raised Catholic my connection to the visuals of them made them look like they were in monks robes with hoods 
and they were brown robes and there was no sense of anything except floating in between them and this overwhelming sense of completeness, cherishedness, it's not a real word, but feeling cherished, uh, unconditional love, coming home. It was like coming home. And as I'm feeling these feelings, one of these beings steps forward, the one on the end on the left steps forward, and he speaks to me. And I'm saying he because he felt male, he felt fatherly, he felt um, protective, he felt caring and kind and loving. And I just felt this sense of connection to him when he spoke to me. A sense of love I had never experienced in my life, a sense of coming home to the very depths of myself, a sense of I am cherished to the very core of my being. I had never felt that kind of love ever. My experience was from a car wreck in the 70s and I left my body and, and flew through what felt like a tunnel of lights just flying at me and then I just emerged into this world of brilliant white light in a, in a place that was nothing but love. That's the only way that can describe it, just a complete feeling of love. And I stood before a being of light that did nothing but love me, was capable of only loving me. And I watched my life, I saw my life review, and I'm the one that condemned myself and criticized myself in the sense that I just wanted to do better. To be in this place and to be in this presence of this light that just unconditionally loved me made me want to treat people better and made me want to love myself. I, I think uh, I was no different than, than a lot of people that, that are always criticizing themselves or uh, feeling guilty about things. That's the way that I was raised. That's the religion that I was raised in, that you know, uh, God was someone to be feared and, and that I would be judged, so I needed to walk a straight line. And it was, it was so different than that. I was loved un unconditionally, and all I wanted to do was come back and do better and love people and, and learn how to love and forgive and be a better person and have something better to offer. And all of the things that I was taught all of my life about the way that religion was or the way that God is through my religion, it just it wasn't true for me in that experience. So I came back with a real thirst to find the truth and find knowledge. Those were the two words that I woke up with that just I heard them over and over and over the importance of finding truth and seeking knowledge. So that's what my life has been about, trying to figure out what it is all about and I'm open to anything. I I, I would uh, listen to anybody, read anything. Um, I just want to I just want to find the truth in everything. But the one thing that I feel like I cannot go wrong with is loving people. And no matter how hard that can be to do at times, it can be really challenging and difficult, then I still have to go to that place where I felt that unconditional love coming from God and, and try to, to get that feeling in my heart and then send that out to other people. So the, the main question that I was asked when I was requested to do this was, um, one of the questions was, uh, you know, was, was my experience that have to do with the religion or the faith that I was raised in? And, and it absolutely didn't. And um, that's, that's what makes me believe that, that um, the one thing that I can know for sure is that we all need to love each other and we need to get rid of this fear energy. I was a scheduled uh, C-section, but I went into labor before that date. Um, when I got to the hospital, uh, they noticed that it was coming pretty quick, so I was into surgery pretty fast. But everything went wrong, absolutely everything. Um, not only did they find that I was bleeding to death, but my son's cord was abnormally long, and it was choking him. So what they did was they, they messed with my, um, from what I understand was told, they messed with my anesthesia. And somehow, it, I don't know, but it, it put me in a place where things got dangerous and the bleeding apparently got worse from there. When they cut my son out, they were trying to save my son, which I said, you have to save my son. I, you know, I had said, 
let me go. I made a choice and it was him. But um, my ex-husband was asked, who do you want to save when I started to bleed so heavy? Uh, and he said me, but please, you know, try to save both. Well, I started to die. So, and my ex-husband was there. I was under, but my ex-husband was there. So he gave me the details afterwards and then I talked to the doctor afterwards to find out what happened because I knew something was wrong because I ended up going somewhere else during the delivery. I was knocked out and I came through this light. I, I, if there was a tunnel, which is what I hear from a lot of people, I don't recall the tunnel. I just remember getting to the end of the tunnel with this light that was the brightest thing I've ever seen in my life. It did not hurt my eyes, but it was the most loving light I've ever seen. It was welcoming. I, it, it was like a drug to go towards it. There was nothing I could do to control it. I wanted to go through it. Um, I get through it and there's this man there on a wagon, the kind you would think of from the 1800s. And I know it sounds odd, but that's what it was. He was over six feet tall. He had dark hair. It was wavy, uh, cut to about here. He was in a white robe with the you know, rope thing. Um, and I was surrounded. If, if anybody's seen that movie Always, where um, Hap, the character Hap, who is uh, Richard Dreyfuss meets, okay, that field of wheat, that was my field. But just remember that that movie was in 1989. My experience was 1983. So when that movie came and I saw that field and I was like, oh my God, someone else must have had that, it's, you know, had popped up there and maybe that's why they used it in the movie. But my gold, when I came into this place, were colors I'd never seen before. They don't exist here yet, or if ever, I don't know. The gold was so pure, not because it was worth all this money, but because it was, I don't want to just say special, but it's like it was holy. I don't know how to describe it. The go every golden wheat plant was gold. I, I can't explain that. The sky was a blue I'd never seen before. It was vibrant, and the white was pure. I mean, nothing, there is no way to describe that white. The whitest thing I could ever see anywhere doesn't come close to this white that I saw there. It just, there's no comparison. And the colors were vibrant. I don't know how else to say it, and I've never seen them here. Um, the other thing that I noticed when I got there, and this man, he told me his name was Gabe. And the love that I felt from this area, from Gabe, was so encompassing. It, it was like a drug. I, I've never felt it here in this earth, ever. That's what being the mother of four now and two grandchildren, it just doesn't compare. It's that powerful. It's that like a magnet. I can't explain it, but it's very powerful. You don't want to leave. You don't. But when I was in this coma, that's where uh, the first experience happened. Basically what happened is I placed above my body, I saw my body, was not interested a bit by it. I did, it was just something, besides it was ugly, I mean this leg and everything was not interesting at all. So I just kind of was floating, I guess, and then um, moved around and then I saw this amazing light that was so magnificent. Um, this, li this light had a, a beam. This beam of light was a lady, a beautiful lady, but just not for the beauty of it. She was, or she is, everything. Everything. When I say everything, it's love. It's peace. It's everything that you can ever want, or dream, or want to go to. She was it. She is it. She communicated telepathically, and I understood. I wanted to curl up in her arms and just stay there. 
I didn't want to do anything else but that and be part of this forever. When I drowned, I was very comfortable and very comforted. I found that I knew I was going to have a problem as soon as I crested the waterfall and realized that there was no outflow. I knew that I was going to have a problem and the boat was pinned and the water then completely covered me and I tried all of the usual things to free myself and free the boat and none of them worked. I didn't ask to be saved. I didn't ask for anything in particular other than God's will be done. And at that moment, I was overcome with the most physical sensation of being comforted and held, almost like you would comfort and rock a small baby. And I thought about my husband and I thought about my young children and again and again and again I was reassured that they would be fine, I would be fine, everything was fine. And then I felt the boat tip a little bit and the current which had ripped off my helmet and my life jacket was slowly sucking my body out of the boat over the cockpit of the boat and as that was happening I could feel my legs breaking and I was wondering and thinking about which bones might be breaking and which ligaments were ripping. My body or my spirit peeled off of my body and then as I felt my body sink with the current I was free. I was greeted by a group of the most joyous spirits and these were spirits that I couldn't identify as oh gee there's my father or my babysitter because each of these spirits were more than just that one person. All colors in one at the same time and they were so filled with love and that's true of everything having to do with heaven and every angel I talk to. There's this all-encompassing sense of love and uh, joy. So they uh, greeted me and we communicated although not in English, not with our mouths. It, it was a form of communication that made me truly, truly understand how God can speak to people of different languages and everyone understands them in their own language. And I'd like to talk about a near-death experience that I had in 1997. This experience was the most profound event of my entire life. And uh, I'm now over a decade away from that experience and still integrating and still unable to understand what actually occurred or some of the elements that occurred. What happened was um, I was uh, in bed and um, a particle from an artificial valve or something triggered a grand mal seizure. The doctors aren't quite sure. I was dead or nearly dead in a, 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 a gasp in uh, death throes for about 20 minutes uh, as my wife desperately f tried to bring in help uh, and I spontaneously came out of it. She experienced horror. I experienced the most fantastic event of my life and the most real event of my life. What happened was and an extensive NDE, what they call a near-death experience. I will talk just about a little bit of it uh, because it would take too long for this. 
what happened was uh, initially I found myself suspended and in a place where there was no place. It was just I, I felt the presence of my body and a grayness or just suspension and nothing. Uh, and as I wondered about what was around me, I, I saw in front of me start to envelop this light that coalesced. Couldn't tell the distance to the light, but it coalesced as a ball. And I marveled at this ball because it was infinite. And it seemed to be the presence I was suspended in that actually took form in front of me. And I, I spent some time just just gaping at this because there was nothing around this ball. This ball contained the universe, somehow I knew that. And there was nothing, no dimensions, no time, no space, no thing. <laughs> it was not something my mind could, could wrap itself around. Um, and I recognized in retrospect, it had to take the form of the ball for me to discern it. The mind can only operate with distinction what is and what is not. And so it made that distinction for me. And as I continued to marvel at this and, and wonder what was happening to me, I started, I started drawing towards this light that had this such presence and such love to it. And as I as I started moving towards it, or it moving towards me, there was no reference point to understand what, you know, who was doing what. Um, I had what many people have called a kind of a life review, and the review for me were events in my life that um, really defined who Jim was, who, who I feel my sense of self is, my sense of self-esteem and identity. And most of them were around places I've struggled and, and been stuck with. And as I experienced an event, it seemed to resolve in my mind and would disappear and another event would emerge. And with each disappearance, the light got brighter and brighter and brighter. But eventually, I began to feel as if I was actually on the edge and then being enveloped by the light. And I felt my legs filling with this light, this presence, this love, this infinite unity, acceptance, absolutely no judgments. All the judgments I had entertained in the life review were mine, and as I let them go, I actually was able to release closer and closer to this light. And as I began to move into the light, as I say, the, the light filled my legs, it started filling my arms, and I began to feel as if I was just dissolving into this infinite presence, this infinite love that was drawing me. Um, but I stopped, and I stopped because if I, could, if I allowed myself to go further, I would lose the sense of self and I would lose the capacity for choice, to choose to be part of the light or not. Who Jim was would disappear. And so that scared me, you know, what would happen once I lost that ability to be separate. Uh, so I withdrew and felt my body become more solid. Again, there was no other events or experiences I had. It was a very timeless uh, um, feeling to it. All of a sudden, I'm in a blue-gray place. I'm floating. I'm at peace. I could move. I'm comfortable. I still never heard of the near-death experience. I roll over and I see myself lying across the bed. But I'm watching this. The wildest thing that people are going to learn about being dead is how much more interesting things you find to be, to be uh, interested in. I mean, <coughs> I was amazed at watching the energy reaction between people and the, they were surrounded with fields of energy and how wondrous these fields of energy were and how everything radiated its own aura and its own hues. And now, as, as we speak, I was watching the people work on me, Sandy and then Tommy who came over and then the paramedics. They would communicate with each other. Their energy field would encompass another energy field. 
It was blues and reds and silvers and golds and pastels. And when you're talking, before you and I speak, our energy fields merge, and then the words come. And then your energy field comes, and then the words come. And it was just amazing to me. I watched them load me in the ambulance. I moved through the walls, and I'm watching the nails and the, the, the structure of how the house was built. And as I move into the walls, I come outside, and I see me, and the raindrops are hitting my face, and they're loading me in an ambulance. All of a sudden, I'm in this ambulance. Well, this, I'm behind the, the paramedic. I'm behind him, and he's working desperately on me. But I'd never been in an ambulance before. It was a truck. It wasn't like an ambulance. Mm -hmm. Like you see, it was a new style. It was a truck. And I was pretty amazed at all the neat little gadgets that they had in the ambulance. I wasn't really paying attention to what he was doing until he said, he's gone, he's gone. And I remember looking over his shoulder and seeing myself and always thinking I was a much better looking guy than that. <laughs> and, you know, I said, wow, you're looking a little rough, Dan. This tunnel begins to form. And as this tunnel, remember, everything is peaceful. This is peaceful. The, the emotion of feeling when you're being, lo when you're loved. Mm -hmm. The moment you lift out of that body, you're safe. No matter what anybody tells you. No matter what. When you start down that tunnel, when people ask me all the time, Daniel, what's it like to go down this tunnel? Imagine this. You're seven years old. It's Christmas. You're going to grandmother's. Grandmother's rich. You're her favorite grandchild. Her name is Disney, and she lives in Anaheim. Mm -hmm. And as you come up to the stoplight, it's stopped, and it's red. When that light turns green, you turn left, turn right, and pull back up into the yard, and Grandma and Mickey's waiting for you. When that light turns green, that's what it feels like to go down that tunnel. You're almost there. You're going home. It's wondrous, powerful, and peaceful. What happened in the hospital room on this particular evening in this true sense of hopelessness, a presence entered the room. I could feel this loving presence. I heard other people say this in a sense of watching people who are near death or dying, people who are observers, that they can see the individual in the bed lighten up or sit up suddenly or shout out a person's name or something like that. It would be the same analogy, like a presence entered, a very loving presence. Maybe you might call it an angel. But it did have a sense of love. Actually, it started in the upper right-hand corner of the room. And it started to come forward. I couldn't see anything, but definitely could feel it. It started to permeate the room. The sense of being in this dimension and another dimension of openness and love. And the presence, as it filled the room, started to comfort me in telepathy. And basically it was, if you want to let go, it will be okay. There was definitely a sense of there would be a transition. It wasn't a sense of an instantaneous feeling. The presence continued to grow and get stronger and more loving to the point in my mind, my heart, my soul, my being felt very safe and comforted. That sense that I would be lifted and alive. And when that fully permeated my sense of Jessica, but also feeling secure in this love, telepathy, in telepathy, I said, yes. Then instantly at that point, I was in a completely different realm, instantaneously. Then there was no earth, no hospital room, no pain, no people, it was all energy. And I was now a point of light, very much me, completely Jessica. 
and my first thought was, I did it. I'm dead. Very aware that I was dead. And great joy. The pain was gone. The excruciating pain. The fact of what would ever happen to me or uh, of having a life with hopelessness. Now it was a realm of perfection. And one of the things that I found was interesting, I was aware that now there was no time. I was aware of infinity, that there was no end. And it seemed absolutely, completely normal. There was no up, there was no down, there was no high, there was no low, and everything really did feel perfect. It all seemed so normal. Some people might call it, I've read, the void. I don't know if I would call it the void because there was a presence all around, a presence of knowledge, a presence of awareness, and that I was me being me. And then my next thought was, it's all a thought, okay, I'm here, I'm dead, what's next? And that's when I describe waves, these waves of energy from right to left started coming towards me from the edges, you might say, but there are no edges, but from eternity, rolling through to me, through me, when the energy rolled through me, I became the knowledge. You could feel it coming, be it, it would pass through, but then you were it. And that's something I find very, very interesting because usually when now back in my body and you gather knowledge and you hear knowledge, you listen to it, you remember it. And you put it in your filing cabinet in your brain. And you'll pull back facts. I remember this. Okay, I remember that. This feeling, this sense, the smell, the event. Perhaps it's a joyful event or maybe a painful event, but you're remembering it. And you can remember it in flashes. But this was different. You became the knowledge. As I describe now in remembering, it was love. A sense of all love, but love in that was knowledge. 